All right, let's call the meeting to order. Uh, Board of Public Works. Yes, August 17th. Uh, Mimi Audrey, I believe, will be recording our every movement. Uh, first is the minutes of the July 20th meeting. Second. Second. Anyone have any comments? Or? All, all, all in favor of approving the minutes as they've been presented? Aye. 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 We have a, a, a dignitary here, a blast from the past, George Andrew Keating. And I believe he may have something to do with item number four. Dignitary? Hmm? Did you say dignitary? Yeah, I believe I did. He said blast oh, from the past. Also, yeah. blast from the past. <laughs> 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 Heavy on the blast. <laughs> That's a real stretch. All right. Well, could I have a, a motion to take number four out of order? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, it's change order number one to contract 106-11 for the expansion and renovation. Well, it's a contract for the design work related to the expansion and renovation of the DPW buildings yes. to HKT Architects. And no change in the cost of the project? No. George, would you like to? Uh, I'll move approval. All right. Second. Second. So a brief introduction to this, and um, I'll let George answer some highly technical questions that summarize, since he's our project manager on this. Um, working with HKT, obviously the scope of services changed for the DPW complex because it was originally an attached building to the existing barns, and now it's not because of code issues and trying to bring the building up to code. So now the building is completely separated from it and it's out back, and the scope of it grew as far as design task goes uh, with central services coming up everything happening so basically there's no change in the fee but there's a change in the scope of services that allow us to design the facility so nothing's changed dollar wise but the scope of the amendment or the scope of the agreements change in what work they're going to do so that uh, the McNulty building is only going to be brought to a conceptual level with a cost estimate so we want to make sure that the barns next door, or the new barns next door, we have contract documents that are ready to hit the street for bidding. And that's the big change is everything is really focused into the new facility at this point, rather than also the McNulty building expansion. So the money saved in this building is being applied to the new building? Right, because there's also not enough construction funds with the Capital Improvements Committee. Uh, there was only the 16.6 million approved through that committee for the building expansion, rather than the 26.4, I think it is, for the entire facility. So because of that, um, I don't think the structure next door is probably going to fall down for a number of years. So the idea of when are we going to be able to expand the storage facility to accommodate all the heavy equipment might be. 15, 20, 30 years down the road from now. So the real focus is into the new complex next door and bring the water department up here. And uh, uh, the McDalty building expansion will take a back seat. Uh, at least we'll have a cost estimate that we'll be able to work through capital improvements starting next year again. And hopefully in a number of years it will get funded. Um, I just want to be clear on this. No change in cost of project is because it's the design. Correct. And their effort is basically being reality. Yeah, right. Um, I was trying to get my arms around what the current design covers and what um, we had hoped was going to be designed when the when the project went out to bid, mm -hmm. and and we started this hoping that the entire complex could be final design. Mm -hmm. And then it seems like a couple of things happened. One is we could no longer use the barns. Um, it sounds like the footprint, the size of the facility we need, is bigger than we thought once we got into detailed evaluation. Also, inside storage of equipment. The fact inside that all the, all the vehicles are coming up here too and right. they're being stored inside a storage building. That was a part of the okay. original barns construction also. Okay. And then I, I recall that that we're proceeding with phase one, which is which is all new buildings, but not 
all the new buildings we hope to have eventually. That is correct. Yeah. And so, does this final design provide us the design for phase one only? Is that what we're getting here? And the co concept level planning for this building here, and it does not address the barns and the future expansion of the storage building that we built as part of this complex to accommodate the 30 odd pieces of heavy equipment next door if for some reason that facility collapsed or was condemned. Okay. And did the architect give us some kind of analysis that showed that what they're providing for under this amendment is roughly equivalent to what they committed to at the beginning of the job? They did, and I came out of to speak to that. If you all remember, the original fee that was charged by the consultant was based on an 8% of the construction cost of the proposed facility. When we started this project, we assumed that we were going to have a facility that was envisioned back in 2006, which is renovating a portion of the barns, putting a very small water department building with the possibility that it could expand, and also putting a garage. And at the time, the garage was not envisioned as a city-wide maintenance garage. So it's a smaller sort of facility. When, so when we negotiated with a contractor, with a consultant, we told them that the fee is going to be based on 8% of the original construction cost, which came out to the $718,000 that you have. Now, and there is $16,000 for specialty services attached to it. When they started work naturally and they found that we could not uh, touch the uh, barns uh, because the first thing you need to do is to have to bring it to seismic design and there is no way you're going to bring a freestanding nursery building to seismic design nowadays. So that idea was abandoned. In addition, what they did is they revisited the, the 2002 needs assessment of the DPW which showed that the size of the building that we were originally envisioning uh, was not going to meet all our needs. So they were given the instruction to design what actually is needed. So they came up with a bigger natural facility, which increased the cost. By increasing the cost of the construction, assuming that you follow the 8%, design fee, which is a fee that we set by looking at all the projects that were done in Northampton uh, for the last probably 15 years, starting with the fire station, if I remember well. Then we took an average. Okay, then we realized that the money allocated for the project could not be actually, uh, is not reasonable. So we approached the consultant and we told them, you know, we would like to get up to a certain point, and this is based now on the percentages of the various tasks. Usually, construction administration inspections about 35% of the construction cost. So if you take that and you start with the around 16 million and you take that off, you come up close to the 700, between seven and $800,000. So when we approach them and said, this is what we would like to do, and we also told them that, you know, we would like to get the McNulty building up to the point where we would have a fairly good estimate, uh, which means that they are going to also look not only at a conceptual design, but they are also going to look at the mechanical systems, because the mechanical systems play an important part mm -hmm. in the cost estimate of a building. Uh, they told us they can do the job. And this is where we are... You know, this is what the amendment is based on. Go ahead. No, I mind this curiosity question. Well, <laughs> the other, um, the other sort of category <coughs> question that I had was it. Uh, it looks like, and I can't pick it out at the moment. There, there are some activities that the architect was going to do under the original scope that now the department's going to do it. I think it's permitting and bidding, maybe? Is that? No, the permitting, uh, we are going to do the permitting. The, the consultant is going to present and prepare for us the technical aspects of it, one way or the other. Okay. Uh, 
most of the time it means uh, stormwater management, uh, landscaping, lighting, uh, and a lot of other items which are specifically stated in the special permit that we need from the planning board. So they're going to provide the technical information anyway. Mm -hmm. So we decided that we were going to make the presentation and prepare the application, which is not a very difficult uh, task, to the planning board and to the conservation commission. Uh, that's one item. The second item is, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the pre-qualification process yeah. which started yeah. uh, back in 2001-2002 uh, with the state. Uh, it is a very complicated, very tedious and very necessary uh, process of choosing ahead of time the consultants, not the consultants, sorry, the contractors and the subcontractors. The DBW has already done this with the water treatment plant sometime in the past. So we decided to save some money and do the pre-qualification ourselves, having HKT naturally advise us on certain um, items. So that is another big item. So the permits and the pre-qualification, it's something that we will do ourselves. So my question is just a question of curiosity. Why do the barns have to toe the line for seismic uh, regulations? New building code. But other buildings don't. Well, I'm saying why the garage and not like the McNulty building or... Oh, the McNulty building would have to meet uh, the code too. Yeah. No question about that. Oh, okay. If, so if it were constructive change. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you leave it alone, you don't touch it, it's, 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 it's yeah. grandfather. You know, if it's just a minor change, maybe it's no big deal. But what we were going to do is much more than a minor change. It's actually four different structures, is that right? That have been sort of knit together over the years. Mm -hmm. There's no way to make it. The, the barns are. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And is that the state code or the stretch code that we now have to look at? State, state building code. Yeah. In actual fact, that uh, last major change from what uh, Louis has a book, uh, it was last year, made things much more stringent. Mm -hmm. Well, the new building will have to be built in stretch code. And that's that, and we city. adopted it. Here that's correct. Unless, unless there's a specific exemption that I'm not aware of. So basically, what we're being asked to do is vote on whether we approve this reorganization of the tasks that HKT is going to work on. Any other? Jim? Uh, before we do that, I I'd just like an explanation of where this money's coming from now. Uh, half of it is coming from Water and Sewer Enterprise Fund that was budgeted, and the other half is coming through capital improvements from the general tax side. What happens if this law goes through? But which law? The law that's in the legislature for a 2% increase in fees. No, number eight. Limited to, limited to. I don't know what will happen. I don't know how much that's going to gain muster or not. My understanding there's a proposal in, and how far it goes, I don't know. If that goes through, it. it We'll throw a real monkey wrench into I think everything. We'll, I think we'll throw a, a real monkey wrench into every city and town in the yeah. Commonwealth. Yeah. 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 Okay, so people ready to call the question? And it's just a follow-up question. Is that fiscal year 2012 funding? Is that? Uh, for the funding that you just talked about? Yes. The enterprise. So it's yes. for CFA. That it was in this year's budget. Okay. All in favor of approving this change? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Uh, Thank contract you, for pavement crack ceiling complete in place to Crack Ceiling Inc. Second. This is our annual contract uh, that we've been putting out. I believe this is our fourth year with a large contract. Um, it's gone down from 100,000 to 75,000. We're actually finally getting caught up on our maintenance of our public ways. So uh, last year's price was 8.28 a gallon. This year it's 8.47 a gallon. There's a small increase on it. And like I said, this should uh, uh, next year's contract should be quite smaller than even 75 as we continue to do maintenance on the city ways. And the materials holding up well? As far as I know, we did have. Two complaints from the Straw Avenue area where people picked it up on their tires. And we talked to the contractor, they actually paid for the, the claims that happened out of it. 
they believe there might have been some moisture in the crack up there when they sealed it, but that's the only location I'm aware of that we've had an issue. And like I said, this is our, technically this is our sixth year that we've done cracks in, but this is our fourth year with a large contract. Ned, with the crack seal, you can uh, do an overlay over that and no problems? Uh, typically, you wouldn't do an overlay. Usually, at, if you need to do work on top of a crack seal, you're going to do a mill and overlay or okay. you're going to do a reconstruction. It's really right. just trying to keep the water out of the roadway so we don't have... So the crack seal is, is in there as a permanent fix. To seal the water off. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. The only time I've seen crack sealing used, I've seen it used in when you've done a, uh, a milling and you have some cracks in the base course, I've seen it done that way and then they seal the top course on top of it. About okay. how many miles of road do we get done with that? That's a good question. Um, let me see if there's a road list. I know there's a road list here, but I'm not sure if there's a mileage. There is a length and it's not tallied. <laughs> Let me get on my calculator. Could you give that to me though? There's um, tens of miles. Tens of miles. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Actually, there's probably about ten miles on here. <laughs> Not ten, just me. Just look at just one of them. Just one of those tens. So I think what we're finding out too is that you know the cracks only after we pave the street, usually within four to six years, we need to go out there and start this preventive maintenance. And that's one thing that we hadn't done in prior years, prior to 2006, 2005. And it just accelerates the de deterioration of the street. So it's, I call it pennies on the dollar for saving the street. Um. Any further discussion or questions? <coughs> All in favor of approving the contract for the pavement crack seal? Aye. Aye. Change order number one to contract 352-11 to Michael Morar, Maori for four stewardship plans in the amount of $5,000. We currently have a contract with, uh, with Mike Moyar, uh, Maori um, for four for stewardship plans. Um, this is a contract um, to get additional consulting assistance from him. He's a licensed forester, and some issues have come up in the watershed where a large to city property are proposing logging and other activities, and we're seeking his input and review of other logging plans that other people put together. So this is a mechanism for us to get input from him on an as needed basis. So it's basically a time and expense type of contract up to 5000 We won't need anywhere near that for the current task, but it will allow us to to get his expertise yeah. when we need it. Yep. So this is to review plans that are not on, cutting plans that aren't on our property but are adjacent to our ownership? All in favor of approving the contract? Aye. 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 Request for permission to occupy Pulaski Park for the Pulaski Day celebration by the Polish Heritage Committee. Second. And they also request a waiver of the fees. Second. Uh, everything's in order in this. There is a request from the mayor's office to waive the fee. Everything else is order on, in order on this request. This has been done every year. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Contract for engineering for landfill maintenance construction to Stantec in the amount of $28,000. Second. What does this do? This is a contract to have Stantec put together some big documents and plans and specifications for a general landfill construction contract at the site. So what it is, we like to have an open contract with a contractor. So if we have maintenance activities at the landfill, we've we'll got someone we can call and do that work. So we don't have any specific projects at the moment, but the work will be related to you know, road grading and construction, landfill gas systems, Drainage systems, anything we check yeah, collection. What they're doing is they're making sure that we adhere to state regulations. Yeah, anything that we, anything that comes up that needs construction, we'll be able to call these people on and, uh, and have the work done. So uh, this is for uh, Stantec to put together some details, bid documents, help us with bidding and construction administration once the contracts in. How'd you happen to choose that number, that amount? 
the 28,600. That was their estimate based on putting together the document, the construction documents, bidding assistance. So it's broken down by task in there. And then there, there are allowances for basic, basic. So you can see all of the pieces of this. You can see the breakdown. No, no, but my point is there's nothing. This is different from the sort of a contract where we would agree to pay X amount, pay for services as we go up to a total amount not to exceed. And that's what this will be. In fact, it's, I think it's doubtful that we'll spend this total amount with Stantec. <clears throat> David Valletters will be the person managing the contract for us, and a lot of that work will be done. So they, they estimated this outer limit? Yeah. yeah. Uh, all in favor of approving this contract? Aye. 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 Request for permission to use Pulaski Park for the Chalk Art Festival by the Northampton Center for the Arts and the Northampton Bid. Uh, this is going to be September 10th, basically all day, and they request a waiver of all fees. Motion approval. Second. Oh, sorry. So, um, so usually in the past they've done a request to do a sidewalk occupancy permit, which we waive the fees on for the festival. Uh, went off with a good success last year. They've asked for it again this year, but they've also included a request to use Pulaski Park as part of this for a mini chalk art festival for children. I believe they asked last year about using the park, and the board said no. Uh, they didn't want to have uh, uh, the, the art on the sidewalks inside the park itself. So a little different request, if I recall correctly. Actually, we were squeezed. Yeah, I was going to say, where were you? Yeah. <laughs> I went to the. Oh, are you done? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I went to it, and I thought Thank it was you. really great, and it was really a great contribution to our downtown area. And so I can't imagine that we didn't want it to happen in the park, and I think that's not a problem, personally. Uh, I believe that, if I may, one of the reasons why we turned it down in the park is because we really weren't quite sure what they were going to be putting on the sidewalks. And with experience, uh, we see that what they're doing is quite acceptable to the community and to us. So there's no reason to deny it. My only question is, is I thought on the permit I saw September 9th and 10th. Did I misread it or? September 10th, That's between the hours of 8 to 4. Okay. However, the sidewalk occupancy permit is Friday and Saturday between 8 and 4. Okay. But they only requested one day for the last week. Oh, okay. For the children. Okay. For the children. They get tired quickly. Yes, I also went to that. It was fabulous. It was great. And I attended the meeting where you guys hammered it out, too. So it really was good. All right, thank you. So, um, all in favor of approval? Let's see. And no controversy about the controversy about the waiver of fees. No. Okay. All in favor of approval? No, there's a letter from the. Everything appears to be yeah. in order. Yes. Yeah. Okay. With a request from the mayor. Okay. Great. So this will be a vote to approve their use of the park, use of the sidewalks, waiver of yes. fees. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Request for permission to use Lampron Park for a rally by the Western Mass Climate Action Committee on Sunday, September 25th from noon to 6. Second. So we have a request to use Lampron Park by this committee. Uh, what they're, they're planning to host approximately 250 people in the park. Uh, they plan to set up a sound system for public speakers and music. Uh, they say the parking will be in the Bridge Street parking lot. The parade will begin at 2 and all participants will walk Route 9, along the sidewalk to the Coolidge Bridge, where we will cross over the bridge with the help of a higher police detail and be back to the park by 3. The rally will continue in the park till 5 p.m. We'll break down by 6 p.m. Um, it's pending a police uh, permit, which the police have put conditions on it that they need to keep the sound at a reasonable level. Uh, they need permission to use Bridge Street School parking lot, which I believe they have at this point. And, uh, but, but the police have not received a parade permit application as of yet. And also, as my understanding, is that they're planning to put, um, besides the sound equipment, generators out there for power and porta potties. So this is an event of 
how would I put it? I don't think we've ever seen an event like this in Lampton Park before. We've used it for staging four parades to go through downtown, but never as a rallying point and an ending point for a parade or an event. The, um, the parking lot is limited at Bridge It sure is. Really, yeah. And what kind of a crowd are they talking about? 250. Maybe they'll walk. Conditions on that they must take public, public transportation. Personally. What did the, what were the conditions that they levied levy down? For what? Police department. I just said that. It said yeah. um, basically they haven't seen a, a, a parade permit yet. Uh, they want the speaker and music's kept at low and reasonable level. That's all they said really about it. That could be a fiasco. Well, also, you know, there's there's no liability with this. I mean, if there's substantial damage to the park. It's our, I mean, I know we, we never let this, I shouldn't say we never, we, we limited the activity as a rallying point, but not to have an event there and all the festivities there before. So it's, it's really your purview, it's, it, you manage the park. Could they park autos at the uh, fairgrounds? They'd have to work that out at the fairgrounds. There's Sheldon Field right down the street. There's the park in my right. So is Lance Brown that little triangle? Yeah, it's, the school? it's in front of the school beside the cemetery. Okay. We don't know what the largest event is that we've ever had there, do we? It's probably the parade, I think. Exactly. The staging event. There. There's a staging area. Yeah. And how many people is that? How many people? Good size. Four or five thousand. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So I mean, yeah. unless it's raining, I don't see what's going to happen. Two hundred and fifty. I mean, it would get lucky. Yeah, two hundred and fifty people sloshing around. Yeah, if it's two hundred and fifty is a, a box fifteen people by fifteen people. Yeah. It's actually a little bit bigger than fifteen by seventeen. <laughs> Number 16, all right, truth be told. Let's get out of sight. Gary's right. Uh, it's not a lot of people. I, I, yeah. I mean, for, especially if we've had thousands queue up there. Yeah. Are they going to be serving food? They did not put that in their application. But they're starting, they're in returning to them. That's correct. And they're speaking. That's correct. And having music. Can't put food. Low and reasonable. You can put conditions on the permit? I would put conditions that, that assuming that the police department got it for a permit, because they haven't received a parade permit yet. Not as of today. Yeah. This is, uh, but they know the list of things that they need to accomplish. They I would assume so. Yeah, well, so, okay. yeah, we generally don't. Yes, unless they have a parade permit. Well, they probably need to know those so they can plan. I was thinking we don't want to really wait. No, no, we don't want to make conditions. I mean, the conditions would be, I suppose you could say, for that they have a permit to conduct their parade. Right? But then if they don't get that, what do we care if they're just going to use the park? Yeah. So yeah. really, if it's 250 people in That's that park point. for yeah. Six hours. five hours instead of two hours or three hours. Okay. All in favor of allowing them to use the park? Aye. Aye. Great. For both, provided they have police concurrence. Yes. Yeah. So if that parade permit. No, no, well, no. I, I think the parade permit is irrelevant, provided that the police <coughs> agree to other oh, right. conditions. But okay. the parade permit, yes, they're going to use the park. Whether yeah. they, I mean, people may not go on a walk anyway. Who knows? I was wrong. Um, all right, number eight is uh, the bill that um, Jim was alluding to a little bit earlier: House Bill 255 and Senate Bill 349, relative to uh, increases in water rates. Actually. This bill that we're here to talk about tonight is not about the increases in water rates. I'm not sure that there's an actual bill that's been filed yet. There's been some... Well, this isn't part of that email you sent out. No. That was an FYI. That's okay. Yeah. This, um, is a, there's been a bill um, at the State House 
uh, called an act, an act relative to sustainable water resources, and it's it has an imp impact on um, potential impact if it's passed on water suppliers across the Commonwealth. We received uh, some information from Mass Water Works Association, um, trying to gather support from water suppliers to submit uh, letters to uh, the legislators to let them know that water suppliers are concerned and opposed to the language in that uh, in that bill as it's proposed. Um, I handed out a, a, a red line strikeout version um, of the language in that bill to you tonight, but um, I guess I could just kind of cut to the heart of the matter um, so you don't have to read through that and understand what some of the issues are. We've, we've talked about some of these in previous board meetings. Um, basically what it does is it, uh, it takes um, the current, there's currently a, a Water Management Act permit statute that exists that governs the withdrawal of water for, for water suppliers, and that's the rules that we operate under every day. And the way we understand is that this proposed legislation really upends the original Water Management Act permit, and um, it changes the balance of water resource priorities in that existing statute by placing more of a priority on uh, aquatic habitat above everything else. So the way the Water Management Act permits right now is it's up to the Department of Environmental Protection to determine what a reasonable um, or allowable water withdrawal could be for a community. And they look at factors like impacts on the environment, aquatic habitat. So they, they take into account a lot of things when they determine what the safe yield is for, you, for a community to take. So what this would do is it would take the power out of the EP's hands and it would put fish and wildlife at the at the heart of determining what the stream flows are for every stream in the Commonwealth. And then based on what those minimum stream flow characteristics are, then the percentage that would be allowed for water suppliers would sort of be gleaned from that. So there's a lot of concern about it because obviously there are water withdrawals that have been happening for hundreds of years across the Commonwealth. And this would change sort of the priority to a stream flow standard which may have an adverse impact on our ability to provide water to the residents. Mm -hmm. So um, that's sort of um, the heart of it, um, that it really empowers fish and wildlife um, to determine stream flows that would have an impact on water suppliers. Um, there are some other things that, um, that, that are also concerning about the legislation in terms of um, water withdrawals may require um, certain mitigations and offsets to occur. So if we wanted to take more water from the resources that we have, there may be um, stipulations that would require that we ha we have, we have offsets or mitigation, which would include things like stormwater recharge, potential wastewater recharge, or other um, impacts to other infrastructure that's beyond what the water enterprise would typically pay for. So for example, if we wanted to increase our water withdrawal, they may say, well, you need, to, you need to use uh, stormwater recharge on certain types of development projects. So you need to retrofit municipal properties, or you may need to do something that would involve construction of stormwater infrastructure from the Water Enterprise Fund, which is not something that you know, typically that's, we've got plenty of projects on the water side just trying to get clean potable water to folks without investing a lot of capital money on stormwater recharge. So there's, there's a lot of sort of funding um, issues, gray areas that come up um, that, are, that are carried along also within the legislation. Um, there was some similar, legis similar legislation that was um, approved by, in Connecticut a couple of years ago, is my understanding, um, by similar rivers um, groups, folks who are concerned about riverways. And um, some of those, some of the impacts that Mass Water Works is concer concerned about, or effects that would, things that would affect us, would may involve monitoring stream flow um, within the watersheds where the reservoirs are and, and having requirements to release water, a certain amount of water to the streams downstream of the reservoirs all throughout the year. It's something that we're not obligated to do now. Um, and it's something that if you're in the middle of a drought and the reservoirs are down 20 feet, we're going to be pretty concerned about continuing to release water downstream in a condition that we've never had to do before. Um, just from the water from a water standpoint, as a supplier, you know, if you run out of water, it's a, you know, it's a big issue. So there are, there are a lot of factors there that, that we're concerned about. Um, and uh, I guess just a little bit more background. I don't want to go on too long about this, but there's a couple of other things that would be important to know. Um, 
there's a there's sort of a parallel process that this bill, as it's proposed, would require that Fish and Wildlife, within, within one year, establish stream flow standards across the continent. So one year, 12 months, <coughs> not a lot of time. Um, when, when the state Executive uh, Office of Environmental Affairs and DEP realized that this legislation was going to be coming, they went ahead and set up a stakeholders group to start talking about stream flow standards. So there's, there's actually been a group of stakeholders that have been meeting for 18 months already, talking about the science behind stream flow standards and, and how that, how some type of agreement may occur um, if you get all the right people in the room. And there's a, there's a group of about 65 folks that have been meeting for 18 months under the Sustainable Water Management Initiative. And the steering committee is DEP, Fish and Wildlife, Department of Conservation and Recreation under the umbrella of the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs. So it's a, a lot of gobble of state agencies that are running this thing. Um, the stakeholders they're attending are the Mass Water Works Association, uh, Mass Municipal Association, Nature Conservancy, Conservancy the Audubon, Charles River Association, Ipswich River Association, USGS, EPA, Conservation Law Foundation, some other academic institutions, MIT, Northeastern, are also represented at this. And uh, it's you know it's been a long struggle I think for 18 months and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of new technical information that's coming out. There was a recent study, a large study that was done by USGS that showed that the, the effects of urbanization and development within communities have a much greater effect on fish and aquatic habitat than water withdrawals do. So there's sort of a, um, the rivers group seem to have put a lot of focus on water withdrawals as the evil that's causing a lot of problems with low flowing rivers. But there's new scientific information coming out that indicates that that's not really the case. And the other thing is that, you know, in general, water um, water suppliers, you know, while water demand in some areas is going up with population growth, you know, the use of water audits and leak detection, a lot of, you know, um, uh, water conservation techniques, a lot of demand is actually going down. Per capita demand across the Commonwealth is down a lot. So from the standpoint of, of being concerned about water, water suppliers are concerned about water. And they do everything they can to conserve it and use it in an intelligent manner. So, in a way, the Mass Water Works Association feels like the water suppliers across the Commonwealth are being made out to be sort of the bad guys in this issue with, you know, rivers drying up. And, and it's a real problem, and there's no argument about Ipswich River drying up, Charles River water quality issues. But I think the thing is that trying to legislate a solution within 12 months is something that's going to put a lot of responsibility um, in, in fish and wildlife's. Uh, court or typically hasn't been there. We feel like there's a system that works now and there's a stakeholder group that's been working for 18 months to come up with a, a reasonably accurate scientific solution, I guess, that, that will work for everyone. Um, so we'd like to play a role. We've been tracking, I've been reading a lot of this information and then it's been tracking the Mass Water Works um, information that they've been sending out to us. And, um, we'd like to draft a letter um, for the board to review and submit uh, Representative Cocott and, and, and Stan Rosenberg, so that they understand from water water suppliers' perspective what what our concerns are. Um, you know, of course, the politics is always um, it's always interesting, and things are always tangled a little bit more than you'd like to. When you read the legislation as it's proposed, if you if you were just to read it without having me explain any of this, it looks great. I mean, it really does. does it, you you look at it and you, you wouldn't be object you wouldn't object to anything in there. Believe me, you, you read it. And it doesn't seem like anything would be objectionable. And um, uh, Representative Cocott actually, I think, was one of the co-sponsors of the uh, of the legislation. So it's it's difficult. He's our representative. We're not in agreement with the legislation because of some of the issues that I've identified here. But whether we send him a letter or we request a meeting with the mayor and just to talk about our concerns, um, it, we would like to do that because we are concerned about it. Um, one thing that has happened is. As the, as the legislation has moved along in Beacon Hill, they did have a hearing back in mid-July that um, was uh, was attended by about 40 water suppliers. It was pretty good contingent. We weren't we weren't able to attend, but there were a lot of water suppliers that were in attendance. I think the, the legislators recognized that uh, they're concerned enough. Maybe we need to take a, a closer look at this legislation to figure out what the impacts all around and. Um, the Senate chair of the committee, I'm just, just reading from an email that I had received, was uh, uh, Senator Mark Pacheco from Taunton was imploring 
the rivers groups and the water suppliers to get together and try to work out a compromise, recognizing at the end of the day we all have a common interest in making sure there's adequate water availability in all parts of the state and that our water resources are healthy, protected, and sustainable for the future. I think that's true. I think everybody, no one's going to be against the overall goals. It's just sort of how do we get to the, to the goals that meet everybody's needs. And the feeling from Mass Waterworks is that because the state has set up a stakeholders group under this sustainable watershed, watershed uh, initiative, that there's sort of in infrastructure there to make it happen. If the legislation passes, it puts the ball right in Fish and uh, Wildlife's court to come up within 12 months a program that will work. And it doesn't obligate that they continue talking to stakeholders and other people that would be impacted by the decision. When you get, if I may, when you get things put together and you're ready, I'll get Cocot in here and sit him down with us and present a case to him that, you know, and show him our side of the story and so that he understands it before he you know, really goes in. There, there's some of this water legislation now that's driving me crazy. You know, uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, um, we cannot put water guns on our fields down here, and yet I think, and I may be wrong, but I think the country club draws out of that and waters their greens and waters their, uh, their stuff. Why should they, when we can't, who are we, the taxpayer, will put enough money to build fields. Why can't we? We're allowed to irrigate our public fields. Yeah. We are allowed to do that underneath the current water. With uh, down down here at Kearney Field? And mm -hmm. Yep. I thought we worked. Parks and recreational facilities are exempt from that water ban. It seemed like there were some modifica modifications from the water ban as I originally understood mm -hmm. it because you can also, for food production, you can also use that's, your Yeah, that's always been in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that exemption's always been in place. They, they uh, had another one this year, you could wash your car one day a week. Last year, you couldn't do it at all. But Only commercial you know, car washes. It really bothers me because when you people pulling out of the river and they're using the river to put a water ban on, <laughs> you know, it doesn't make sense. So, Jim, you're going to work on this letter? Yeah, Ned and I, we're going to draft the letter and send it around for board members to take a look at it. We just want to make sure that you are comfortable how, this is how Jim and I feel about it, that, you know, if there's a drought, we keep flowing streams, our water supply is doing that much faster. How does the board feel about that? Obviously, you know, we want to be supportive of aquatic life and wildlife and so on, but uh, as a water supplier, there's a different role for us, too. So we just want to make sure that we don't want to send something to the uh, our representatives and, and senators without your your thoughts also, and you as a board should be signing that letter. Perhaps not There's myself no, and Jim. No control whatsoever once they make the law. I mean, you you are the water commissioners. Yeah. Well, it yeah. sounds like since we got, I'm sorry. It sounds like since they set up a, a stakeholder group, that sounds like a, a terrific venue to sort of work through the science and come out with something more reasonable and balanced. The stakeholder group is, um, you know, has been a good thing, I think, in my, in my opinion. Um, the stakeholder group, I, I mentioned that it was sort of a manifestation of the spending legislation, but it was also set up because of, uh, there was about a two or three year court battle in the state courts that went all the way to the Supreme Court because the DEP had started to put conditions on water withdrawals that water suppliers contended weren't they weren't allowed to do under the current Water Management Act statute, mm -hmm. and uh, DEP fought that. And the, the the rivers groups were supportive of DEP's desire to put restrictions on water withdrawals, mm -hmm. and that made it all the way to the Supreme, <coughs> state Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court ruled. Well, if you talk to each side, each side think that they thought that they won. But the way that when I when I read the when I read the final when I when I when I read the final decision, like what I got out of it was that the uh, the water suppliers were actually in the right, and that the state was not allowed by the statute to arbitrarily put conditions on uh, historic water withdrawals. But this, the the Supreme Court said they could they were allowed under the law to implement regulations which would then allow them to put conditions on historic water <coughs> withdrawals. Because what happened uh, originally when the Water Management Act permit was signed into law in the 80s, 
there was a lot of towns like Northampton, you know, we've been withdrawing water a lot, a lot sooner than 1984, whenever that Water Management Act permit was, was approved. So when the Water Management Act was approved, it grandfathered all historic water withdrawals. And they said those are, those are um, registered withdrawals. So if you had a historic <coughs> withdrawal, you could continue to, the community could continue to draw that amount of water without getting any type of permit. All you need to do is register with the state, tell them, yeah, we've tip, tip you're taking four million gallons from this watershed, and we're going to continue to do that. But the EP started to put conditions on that, where you can only take four million gallons if you do this and that and other thing. And that's what that lawsuit was about. So when the, when the Supreme Court case was solved, DEP also at that point said, well, we need to get stakeholders together to start talking about what these new regulations may be and how these new regulations are also going to be tied to stream flow indicators. So there's some overlap between this legislation and the Supreme Court, but basically it's been a, an ongoing um, discussion between folks concerned about rivers and low flow and aquatic habitat and water suppliers is really how it's going to come down to it. So you'll get us a letter and talk about Who is proposing the original, who is pitching the original um, law to Cook? Do you know? Um, I think the original legislation was written by some of these rivers groups that, mm -hmm. that I had mentioned, instead of stakeholders. So uh, Charles River Association, the Ipswich River Association. And isn't it sort of ironic that the other email that you sent around that proposed having a maximum 2% increase on water rates would sort of contradict this because you want to be able to increase rates to be encouraged conservation. <laughs> that's something, yeah, that's definitely something we'll have in mind be tracking. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Discussion of change order policy. This grows out of that uh, $100,000 change order in our last meeting. Yeah. Well, um, I was approached by Terry to talk about how we might create a procedure or a policy with the Board of Public Works as to uh, change orders and how we might go about that going forward in the future, uh, perhaps ensuring that work isn't done in advance without a board signing a change order, which you know they're not supposed to be doing. And that's what came out of the Bradford Street Pump Station, that there was work being done because of the timeline of the grant and trying to get the <coughs> contracts on the street and the work was done and we didn't find out after the fact that they had done the work and they had overrun their budget. So uh, Terry and I had talked about creating some kind of policy as to how we would not let, how this event would be happening again. And I brought it up tonight so that we could get your input, what your thoughts and comments are on it. Um, obviously there's the letter of the law we have to meet. Um, I mean, you could have told them that we didn't improve it and they'd had no money, but. There was some out of scope work that was done, things like that, that we discussed about. So I'm not sure what's, if you have anything on your mind about that, what you'd like to do. Um, you know, there are dynamic things that happen in the field that necessitate change in the field. And sometimes those can come back as a change order after the fact. And that's why I talked to Terry about tying your hands to some degree that it just stopped the wheels of progress when you really need to get something done. And that's what kind of happened, I think, with the police station. There was an ordinance, was an ordinance that was passed that allowed them to recognize small change orders up to $25,000. $35,000 without going back for approval. So it was kind of like a, not a blank check. Who's recognizing that? The uh, building committee? Yeah, $35,000 okay. is a cap on a multitude of little change orders that could come along and sure. give them, just like what you just did a few minutes ago with your $28,000. Yeah. Know? It's a fund that you can draw from. And, um, well, the idea, I think, if I may, is the idea is not to, not to um, not to limit the contractor. It, we legitimately we want to pay what we ask for, mm -hmm. and that's why I was so concerned. I. I are, were these things that we asked the contractor to do mm -hmm. above and beyond the scope of services? If they were, then we should pay for them. Mm -hmm. But we certainly should know, you know, ahead of time. I, uh, 
and, and again, I think that the communication was bad there. Uh, how we legislate that, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Equally concerned, I, I wasn't even as much concerned that, that, that we didn't know as a board. Well, actually, 100,000, 90 some odd thousand is quite a bit of money. But um, Ned and Jim didn't know either. This was a, kind of a surprise to everybody. Yeah. Um, and it seemed to me that we could at least have some language that would say ch change orders above any certain amount, uh, some certain amount of money need to be at least discussed? Or? Well, there were, there were a multitude of things that happened uh, with that, that made the situation the way it was. And one of them was a mistake that the Department of Public Works made a long time ago with the siting of the pumping station. And that pumping station was on Parks land. That's right. Something happened in 1996. We don't know who dropped the ball, but Someone did, and also we're scrambling, trying to get temporary permits from DCR to be on their property. I mean, this was all uh, through a, a legislative act, basically, that gave the property through DCAM to us, but no one followed through to make it happen. So here we are, going down the road to a construction. All of a sudden, it's like, well, we don't own the land, we don't have easements to be on the land yet. We're ready to go. We got this 1.125 million dollar state grant that help offset the cost of it, and that disappeared on June 30th. I mean, so we were really pushing for the design to get it out on the street. We didn't realize that um, SCA had overruns on the design until after the fact. We understood that we were looking at change orders for the work that we asked to be done to help us with the easements and the siting and some other work, technical work that had to be done as part of the, uh, the design process, the MEPA process, things of that nature. but. You know, conservation commission, etc. But the, you know, like I said, the, the thing that snuck through the back door was the overruns on the design that we weren't aware of until after the fact. Which was by far the larger part of that uh, change order. Chief, I guess like I said, well, I, I brought your concerns up. I had mentioned that Jim Dostal was concerned about the cost overruns and the continuous to the city council, and um, I had also brought it up to Terry Anderson and the mayor that I was furious. I'm still mad as hell about it that we've actually spent this money and I reviewed the tape and the meeting and the minutes again today and in that agreement, it was right there on the tape, that Coca-Cola had agreed to rebuild that pump station. It was in the TIF agreement. It was their job to do that and this grant came along and I don't know why, it was, I voted no on it because I wanted Coca-Cola because they had already had their permits. They were ready to roll. And we took it off out of their tip, and, I don't, and I'm still furious about it. And now we're at. I asked Ned at the last city council meeting. It's eight hundred thousand, or almost nine hundred thousand dollars we've spent on this, out of our enterprise fund money, or wherever it came from, that was actually supposed to be paid for by Coca-Cola. We had already made the agreement with them. It was in a contract. So, that's where this thing got screwed. I don't know who took this out or how it got removed from the TIF, but it was a signed agreement in March of 2009 that, 2010, excuse me, that Coca-Cola was going to upgrade the system. And I asked the question of Terry Anderson at the meeting, I will approve this because Coca-Cola is going to upgrade the Bradford Street pumping station, period, because I thought it was corporate welfare, this TIF, and it always bugs me when we do that. But anyway, uh, she said, yes, Coca-Cola is responsible for the upgrade of the Bradford Street pumping station along with this TIF. So, and now we're going to hit a million dollars on this thing, I'm afraid, out of your money. <clears throat> Thank you. Jim. Terry, getting back to the, uh, the issue of the policy and the, uh, the client builder, you know, issue. I think, you know, as, as Ned said, there were, you know, there were some things that we could ask them to do, but the, you know, the real, the real thing that's problematic is when there's a, when there's a large overrun on design and the, and the firm is not communicating to us that, if, you know, we're going down a road where they're going to be tens of thousands of dollars over budget. So that, that to me is the real, um, you know, that to me was the real 
issue with the with that last change rule with SCA. And, uh, and it my, seems to me I, I'm not prepared to suggest what the wording is, or I mean, you know, conceptually on the back of a napkin, you have to like, oh, this would work. You know, like I'll cut the cake, you choose the piece you want. There must be some way to boil this down into a process that would then need to be fleshed out, but that would be fair. Give, make a, give uh, you enough latitude to keep the project moving forward without coming back to the board for every tiny little change, and yet hold them responsible to communicate promptly if there's something. And I don't want to put Mike on the spot, but he may have some thoughts because of all his years in, in, in the business, but I know that on the, we could put something in the, you could actually put a condition in the contract, something to the effect that the city will not entertain any change orders unless, you know, we're uh, staff is timely notified of, of pending uh, potential overruns on on the fee for the project. That, that, just, that's just my thought, but yeah. you'd have to flesh that out. Right? Yeah, but it could be boilerplate right in the, all our contracts going forward, so. It's not a policy, it's just it's a contractual matter. Right. Because it's, it is a problem when, it, when you don't find out about it until it's tens of thousands of dollars in and everybody's scratching their head saying, you know, $60,000. What the heck happened? Yeah. On a relatively small contract. Somewhere. Yeah, the original contract, I think, was about 350 355 I think it was. 20%. Mike? I, I, seen this issue come up over and over again and I've never seen a good solution for it. You know, the, the, the solution that usually ends up in a contract is you, thou shalt not do any work until it's approved. And we all know that's unmanageable and it'll hold up the project and we'll be in worse shape than we are now. And so then anything less than that becomes a little soft and it expresses intent but I think this consultant, every consultant already knows the intent, and that is you don't, you're not supposed to spend the money until you tell somebody. Right. And, and there's no contract that says go ahead and spend all you want and then come to us later and tell us how much. So we all know what to do in the consulting business, and as, as uh, administrators of the contract, we know what to expect. It just didn't happen, and so I don't know how you... I don't know that there's a real good way to try to nail it down. There, we could probably at least express our intent more clearly in the contract, and we probably ought to do that. But um, ultimately, I think it's, it's the staff gets stuck um, making sure the consultants and the contractors um, communicate. I mean, it sounds backwards, but if if we want to avoid this, then I think we're stuck pushing harder on our end, and maybe being, you know, a little mean sometimes, or a little strict in how we interpret things, and, and, and I think people will then recognize that, well, that's what Northampton requires, we better do it right the next time. Yeah, and you'll find, you'll find that the best project managers in the business will, are the ones that are the most upfront in communicating right. when you have a problem, and it's the ones that they're not as good project managers either. They don't realize that the project's going, going crazy in terms of the budget, or they're afraid to have a hard, they're afraid to have that conversation, which is always a difficult one to have, but it's necessary. Um, so you know, I've taken to particularly with Kleinfelder. Every time I had, you know, we had a conference call with them a week ago, and at the end of the conference call, I said, "How are we doing on the budget on all these tasks?" Every time I talk to them, I'm like, "Where are we on the budget? Where are we on the budget?" Because you know, I don't want to have this happen again with them. Um, so, the person managing the Bradford Street pump station is not someone I had worked with before, and, and clearly he wasn't meeting what our expectations would be. Other folks that we've worked with longer that we know more about, we know that they communicate well. Uh, AECOM is, an, is one example. Tom Spear, in the minute there's any potential chance they're going to need more money, of course, he always lets me know, and they're, they're not afraid to ask for it. Um, but, you know, we, we can certainly you know, keep asking the questions. Right. and. Uh, Make, you know, make sure that we're getting the answers. So you're arguing that this may not rise to the need for a policy? I, I, I agree. I think we can come up with something. I was just, I was just arguing that it's, it's not going to be real precise language. Yeah, I, I think we could take a stab at it and uh, come up with some kind of language and uh, 
Runner by the board? And say, runner by Joe Cook. What's, what's legal? What isn't legal? You know, we've think, done it before. I think Mike's right. We could put some language in there. It might be pretty squishy and gray and tough to enforce, but it might be something we can point out. Yeah. At the very beginning of the job, he's saying, look, you know, condition number four says yeah. whatever the gray language is that, you know, you need to communicate to us as soon as there's a potential issue. And then, you know, it's not really, it would be a, something that would be pretty difficult to enforce, most likely, but it shows the intent of wanting to, to have that knowledge of this problem. What was the time frame that accumulated with SEA, that, that, that time period that they were accumulating that extra well, work? It was, it was a few months, might have been three or four months. Yeah. And the other issue that made it difficult for me to track is they weren't sending us bills. That's why I had no idea. I, we weren't getting bills from them in a timely manner <coughs> on that job. So it's, you know, that's one way to check. We get invoices and we approve them. And, geez, you know, how can these guys be at 95% of the budget? I haven't seen anything from them. You know, you can ask the question then. But in that particular project, it was moving really quick. We weren't getting So maybe bills. that's one thing that can be put in the language is a requirement that the invoices more nearly track the timing of the events. And you uh, Mimi have a comment? Or uh, first well, just as a taxpaying citizen of the city, um, the first is, you know, this was SEA, and SEA just got also given a $28,000 contract again tonight for approval. So part of me would say, you know, maybe you don't go to SEA right off the bat. Maybe somebody else gets it. That's a so signal to them that they messed up. It Instead, an SEA. It was an SEA. Oh, sorry. I thought it was. But anyway, the second thing is, um, it seems to me that in the world of lawyers, there's always a way of making language work, such as if you don't notify us by X amount of time, then that it'll be up to dispute whether or not we pay you for the change order. I mean, it just seems to me that, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, but I know that there's tons of them in the law school right now, and there's always some language. So, so you think that there must be a way to do that? I would say that there's definitely some way to do it. Maybe it's not friendly to the uh, contractors, but I would say that on the behalf of uh, the ratepayers and the taxpayer of the city, I would hope that uh, you guys would figure it out. Yeah. How come you don't turn the camera around? Because <laughs> everybody doesn't need to see me. <laughs> <laughs> do we require them to submit monthly invoices? Is that they send them. This and, one, and that's what they're kind of practice is you get a monthly invoice. I, I, I've seen that requirement. So th th maybe that's what we do. It's just as part of the contract. Mm -hmm. Then there's, there's language in there that gives us a tracking form. That that helps. But a, a, an invoice comes out a month after a, a month after the last charges were accumulated. So you're always a month behind. So it, it's a tool, but on some jobs it's over by the time the invoice comes out. We did, have a, <clears throat> we did have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our client manager, Vin Spada, who you've met here before, about this particular issue, and also tracking on the uh, comprehensive wastewater management plan. And we want to make sure that they're in budget on that also. Yeah. No Great. surprises. Mm -hmm. They're doing very well on the, on the comprehensive wastewater management plan in terms of both billing and the level of information that they send to the monthly basis by, by task or the summary percent complete. We're having routine calls with them. That, that project's being very well managed. It's another person managing it over there. Mm -hmm. So you'll come up with some language somewhere. Take your time. Take a month. I mean, I don't know if that seems like a lot of time, but yeah, you know, I don't think it's already gone by. Uh, <laughs> take another month. You know, I'm not thinking that you need this for beginning of September, mm -hmm. but just if you on the radar screen. Yeah, understood. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, claims committee meeting, 15 Warren Street. Is that we have one? We have a committee meeting scheduled for the next meeting. Yeah, it'd have to be the second meeting in September. Twenty-eighth, is it? So we're going to be on the 14th and the 28th? Yeah. 14th, you already have one scheduled. At 10 after. Do you have to go to church? Well, it's about a church. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we come? Uh, so I guess we'll go for the 28th? Mm -hmm. Is it 5 o'clock or 5 o'clock? 
Five fifteen. So five fifteen on five fifteen on the fourteenth and five fifteen on the twenty eighth. No, five ten on the on the fourteenth. Yeah. <coughs> you needed an extra five minutes for that. Oh right, actually, yes. Right? Yes. That's true. Okay. Great. Uh ooh, swack. <laughs> <laughs> Swear you. Swear you. <laughs> we had a great meeting this morning. We had uh, Karen did some great outreach, and we had four new members, mm -hmm. uh, community members, who came in and joined to focus on people look at this uh, reuse facility, this reuse center that uh, mm -hmm. we're sort of following up on. On September 17th, we're doing a reuse fair, trying to pull together all the places that have some sort of reuse and put them all in Smith Folk in the morning and get people to come in to bring all the stuff into one central place with the people who pick it up and will take it away at noon. Uh, we're looking to survey people who participate in that to get a better sense of the community's needs and desires for that. And we've, like I said, it was a very animated group this morning. We seemed focused around the September 17th sort of kickoff event. And we have a tentative dream proposal. Green Reads Facility Proposal. Yeah. We've been circulating our thoughts about what the Dream Proposal would look like. So at our next meeting, we will have <coughs> done the, the one event. We are going to tour the site next door, the Mass DOT site, and then come in and meet and talk about where to next. And Jay, there's uh, members of the uh, board <coughs> that are interested in maybe joining us for that tour. Oh, great. Who, uh, who are the new people that came? A uh, woman named Jean Carey. Uh, uh, Daniel, then, Dennis Daniels, Dennis Daniels, Liz Abbottbull, and A. Pagelstein. That Kenji. Yes, he did. Good. And we had a nice little discussion. He's been on this was, for right. So he told us. He was sort of negative, and I helped. I think I helped him reorient to a positive perspective. Nice conversion. We can get on. <laughs> well, he's, he's <coughs> not with these two. Labor. Okay. That's right. With you, maybe, but I... No. So did everybody Absolutely. hear that on the 21st of September at 8.30, we're hoping to maybe go tour the um, adjacent state property, the little highway, mm -hmm. as I always say. Yeah. yeah. So you'll... Is that the same night as that? No, we have one more meeting before then, so we can... Okay. Great. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, Gary? Thing you'd like to talk about? Um, Jim, how about you? Okay, I'll say something. Else. I did notice the uh, extra wide crosswalks downtown. I think they look really good. Yeah, they look great. They are great. That was done as a mass DOT project. When was it finished up? Because it seemed, it seemed like a couple weeks ago. It was done at night time. <laughs> oh, okay. So they came through Northampton, Greenfield, Hadley, Amherst. I mean, they had a number of sites across the, uh, uh, the the county where they did this. Uh, it was completely funded by Mass DOT. Where did they put them in? I, I don't try for the center. The really the Route Nine corridor, uh, starting at uh, Elm Street down. At, at the end of Elm Street at Academy of Music, uh -huh. down through. The only walk they didn't do was at the Academy of Music crosswalk there because we got that design charrette from nice and nice and. Nelson Nygaard. Nelson Nygaard, and what we might be doing down there, we didn't want to put the thermal plastic down if we might be tearing it up in a somewhat short period of time. So that's the only intersection that we didn't tackle on that project. But um, all the, the Route 9 corridor basically got done through downtown. Um, they look great, they're big, they're bold, yeah. they mimic what happened on Elm Street. Could I ask a question about, we keep seeing it in letters to the editor and so on. Uh, the high school crosswalk. Uh, yeah. What are we going to do there? Yeah, people, the new signs went out this week out there, so there's all new pedestrian crossing signs out there to start. And um, we were talking about trying to eliminate some parking spaces down there, so a little more uh, sight. sight distance for the pedestrians. Yeah. I tried to get some of that removed in 2001. I was told no, it wasn't going to happen by the, the principal back then just that visibility of, of taking that away and get the students out there a little bit. So we're, there's some conversations about that. 
But the big thing is that we've got new pet, pet signs up there that have never been there before. Okay. Isn't there a 20 mile an hour speed limit that's applicable in school to school elementary schools? On, elementary schools only. Oh, exactly. That's a state law, and they have flashing lights at those zones. Right. Not high school. Well, we were talking about the, what Smith College did with the, the 25 mile per hour advisory speed. Advisory yeah. sign. And whether or not we could do that up by the high school. Could do it. You could, as a matter of funding, what was that? Probably a minimum of seven, eight thousand dollars for that. Other radar sign, the sign is yeah. over four thousand, and then you know the installation was another five hundred. Okay. So if you do that, you have to put the radar thing up. No, you could just put the advisory speed limit signs. I mean, you could put them. We have islands there. You could put them right on the islands. And, I mean, the thing, it's one of those things where, I mean, I'm no traffic engineer, but I've talked to a lot of them, and the more signs you put up, the, you have to be careful. Okay. You can't limit. read them all when you're right. 35 limit. miles an hour. Go <laughs> home. And then the question is, from which direction do you, you know, you have to make a decision. At Smith, it was, you were trying to get people to slow down to 25 miles per hour before you got to where you were supposed to be at 25 miles per hour, beyond the crosswalk where they have the fatality. Right. And plus, that's in the area where you start getting that, that fall season. You have that blinding light. You have glare um, from about September 15 at 8 o'clock in the morning. The, sunlight, the sun is rising right in your line of sight as you're approaching the crosswalk in front of the campus center. So you're trying to get people to slow down before they get there. that. So now what's the process for us to go and revisit the parking question, the parking spaces? That is city council driven by your local councilor or the Transportation Parking Commission. It needs to be a recommendation for someone to bring to council to change. And probably transportation and parking. Um, either that or uh, Councilor Murphy could sponsor it. And he's the local councilor for that area. But definitely look at removal of these one of the two spaces coming towards Locust Street. We'll help that visibility issue. Coming west or east? Coming west. 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 On, on the, um, on the uh, park, park side. side? Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's two spaces, and then the crosswalk is right there after yeah. that last space. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, Jean? The biggest number of calls that I ever get is about the speed bump at College Lane. People love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking, is that was that is that design like that's supposed to be like that? Um Yeah, in principle, yes. I mean it was supposed to be raised. It, it is a uh, it's a three hump speed yeah. bump, so there's actually three high points on it. Yeah. Um but the pavement wasn't placed very well. And so we just uh, sent a letter to the contractor saying we wanted to replace it. So that's the pavement that is within the, the, the crosswalk curb box. So there's two yep. crosswalks there that are framed in granite curb. And the, um, the eastbound, eastbound ramp, so that's on the west side of the thing, we want that whole thing replaced also. Uh, the, uh, the opposite side of the ramp seems to be okay. <laughs> I wasn't fooling when I said that's the biggest number of calls I get. You can't imagine that I can't go into a diner or anything without yeah. somebody saying, hey, what about that? Yeah. <laughs> and they don't say it quite as nicely as I just said it. <laughs> uh, I've heard similar comments. Okay. Yeah. Just want to let you know it's out there. People don't like it, and, and I can understand why. It's, it's one thing to have the raised thing, but it's really not smooth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's like you're hitting more than just a home. Yeah. It's three. It's it is three. There's three high spots. And yeah. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Three high spots three and high two spots. quick snaps where the yeah. black top yeah. is. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. Right. Black top is <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so that's it covers that, Jim. This yeah. all started yeah. with your question yeah. about that. Uh, just for a comment, uh, we have temporary speed tables going on in Riverside Drive probably next week or so as part of the traffic calming center for that neighborhood. And that way we'll be able to do traffic counts. And typically we've seen the speed limits drop anywhere from 5 to 10 miles an hour after installation of these speed tables. Just so you know, there are two of them are going in for 
a period of time just before school starts so we can track uh, and see how it changes uh, drivers' habits. Oh, I know how to change them on the other side, right? Yeah. Ooh, it changes, it, it not only changes them for the time period, but it also changes them for like another 10, 10 minutes after that. Yeah. I don't like that. Let me ask it, if I may. Well, hey, look, yeah, look, look, are, they are they 12 feet in each lane? Is that? No, I don't believe they're full 12 feet. Um, we put them on Grove. I believe that road was slimmed down to 22 feet or 24 feet, and there was a good foot, foot and a half on each edge on the gutters. Okay. So one wheel on, one wheel off here. So well, I was thinking actually right. both wheels on the pavement and none on the, on the hump. You're not going to want to hit it doing more than 20 miles an hour. Well, I wouldn't. I generally don't make it that fast in that section. Now, always the knock against these sort of things with the fire engines. Yeah. And well, is that suddenly fine. not a problem? or? What? They're not on primary routes. I mean, that was their biggest concern was primary routes. Um, For example, Elm Street. Riverside Drive isn't a primary route? Uh, I think it's a collector, not a primary. Oh. So I would have to... But we put them down on Meadow Street, and that's when the fire department was down there. The police department was down there. They're trying them at different speeds. They had, you know, and, and they came up with it. We think we can handle this type of device. So there's one on Jackson Street. You know, no, that one on Jackson Street is not uh, <coughs> really up there. I mean, it's it's a, a long, long one. It's a, it's more of a table than a home. Yeah. The ones on Grove Street. You hit those in an ambulance at 20 miles an hour and you're throwing the guy out of the stretcher. Yeah. Now, it's not funny because I was in the stretcher. <laughs> <laughs> down on Meadow oh, Street <laughs> when they tested these things out. I was in the stretcher. And, and I'll tell you, it, it is unbelievable. And that's why I, I kind of worry about Riverside Drive. Well, slow down. It was all part of this, the traffic common request and something that we were going to do. So wow. it's temporary. It's, I think, uh, about a month long. Yeah. And then they get taken out. They, these are the same ones that were on Grove Street, right? That's correct. And they were also on State Street. That's correct. Last year. But I thought they they're were. They're currently really down in <laughs> Ward 3, down on Holly and Williams. 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 Oh, that right? I thought that that bridge was going to have. The weight changed on it, did it? Clement Street Bridge? Clement Street Bridge, yeah. There was no weight change from the state that came out. I've not seen a reposting limit from the state yet. Mm. That's what we wanted. Yeah. So we can try and limit the heft of the vehicles yeah. coming over that. I can ask yeah. the state about that. I just haven't seen a reposting. Yeah. Um, and, 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 where are we with that bridge? When's the inspection due? Uh, state inspects it every other year. Okay. And nobody's... It's in their schedule. Yeah. They'll probably be done sometime next spring, I would say. And do we get a report on Oh, yeah, we get go? a report of every one of our bridges. Anything with a span of 20 feet or greater, we get a report on. Okay. Except for Hotel Bridge now. That's off their list. They were walking on it the other day. That was probably our consultants for the CPA grant. Oh, DOT truck was there. Really? Yep. Two guys were walking on that bridge. Um, Chief Ice was yesterday. Well, maybe I got a freebie coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jim? I've got one thing here. Um, Karen uh, provided me with some length uh, tonnage update information. I know at the previous board meeting, some of the board members have asked for an update on how things are going and that sort of thing. And uh, Karen spent a little bit of time today giving, giving me some uh, some tonnage update numbers. Um, generally, we're still down about 25% um, in terms of receipts at the landfill, tonnage coming in. Um, probably mainly factors related to the economy and also related to uh, uh, Valley Recycling. Um, the change, I took a quick look at some of our, some of the, the top landfill accounts and it looks like a couple of the accounts that, that weren't coming to us back in the February, March time frame um, have started to come back. So we're seeing a couple of the smaller accounts. Uh, I'm only gonna, some of the, I don't know, a couple of the accounts that weren't coming in are not coming back, I guess, something like that. Some of our, uh, some of the other, some of the, the major accounts that we have, like with Allied Waste, 
Um, when we made the adjustment to the tip feed, they actually started bringing more material in, so we saw a little bump up from them. Um, alternative recycling, we'll, we're starting to, to look at other disposal sites, and it looks like they're pretty much coming back to, uh, you know, to the landfill <coughs> with the amount of material that they've brought in historically. We, we never saw any change in waste management. And, you know, I think the you know the big issue is that Duso was historically the largest customer, and now he's not the largest customer. So, and that hasn't changed with the adjustment to the tip. <coughs> um, so, you know, over, overall, you know, I think all our accounts are holding, you know, holding steady, and, and the tip fee adjustment's been helpful. But uh, we're still down, you know, somewhere about 25 percent in the tonnage this year. So, including the reduction in the tip fee, will be down to. <coughs> Be somewhere in there. Is that still above break even? You know, I didn't look at that. I didn't have a chance to take a look at it. I got these numbers this afternoon, but we we had pretty conservative revenue projections in, in the fiscal year budget this year. So. Let me help you with that, Mike. I also have an, I've got a couple of copies of Karen uh, to put together a summary by month of of tonnages for the landfill for, for a whole number of years. If anybody's interested, I can give you a copy of that. I don't want to give, you know, distribute it. I don't want people who are interested in, in seeing it. It's lots of fun if you're like looking at landfill tonnage data for the last <laughs> the last few years. But, um, it's it's interesting in, so, in some ways just to get a sense of you know what the monthly variations are and what it's been from year to year. So she was pretty busy today trying to pull together some of this one. What percentage did do so take out when he opened his? Uh, that's a good question, Jim. I'm not sure I, I know the, um, the number off the top of my head, but you know, do so was the biggest hauler. He was, he was the biggest customer. So, and you know, he doesn't put anything around for that. I, you know, he's he's. Well, you know, a few times, but <laughs> just a fraction of what. They used to bring in. Where where's he dumping? At Valley Recycling. He opened that place on South Street. Right. I know. It's it's he takes it to Springfield and it goes on a train. I think. I think. Uh, yeah, I think they're direct hauling out to New York State. Yeah. So. so he must have bought a couple of new trucks. Big. Yeah. Transfer trucks. I assume he has it contracted out. It's oh. quite an expense to do. Yeah. When you're just starting off on your operational plan, you're talking with it. A walking floor trailer with a truck, you're going to spend you know, $150,000. Takes a lot of tons to use for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. My neighbor Charlie McCarthy went to do so the other day, and he went with contractor cleanup bags, and he had six in the back of his little red S10 pickup truck, and they charged him $12, and the guys came out and they unloaded his truck for him. Came back, he was all smiles, he was ecstatic. He said, you can't believe it, he says. This isn't supposed to be slow if they're like slow. Oh. <laughs> well, well, now that we're, um, now that our, our, uh, our gatekeepers don't have to collect money, they can start unloading uh, trash for people. <laughs> <laughs> or we can cut down on the number of gatekeepers. Of course, your gatekeepers were uh, collecting money with the stickers on Saturday when people do the stickers. They're taking that money. Yeah, and then they have no one to. They have to take that money home with them on Saturday because no one collects it. So all that money they walk home with too. Just FYI. He's talking about annual stickers. He's talking about cheap down there. Yeah, annual stickers. So those add up. But I just want to say one other thing about the Do So place. Someone told me today that they're open until 8 o'clock on Thursdays. And I know that when we had the Solid Waste Action Committee, that was one of the things that some people talked to us about was the fact that because of the hours, they couldn't use the transfer station or landfill because of their work hours that they couldn't get to it. So just not saying that you have to reevaluate your hours. I'm just saying that that's something that they have done often. Interesting point. I went off, set on a slow day, and not have the facility open here on a Tuesday during the day. But they have longer hours, a couple of Thursday, Friday here. Exactly. Think about You'll be trial and error on this for a while. Yeah. Now, are you going to do a questionnaire on both sides of the street when you're doing it, by the way? 
over, I think we're just on the just 17th. Oh. We're going to just focus on the folks who are doing the research. Right. So, yeah, so I can ask the people across the street random. that don't, don't come over. No, not if that going so, um, <coughs> anything? I'm good. I was going to mention the speed bumps but on Riverside Drive. Can, my only question for that is why are they, the, the, the traffic seems to go the fastest right before it comes down the hump by Federal, but the speed bumps are up by Fiker and then on the other side of Norwood. Sir. They want them on the flat area to start and they need to be within 300 feet of each other. Oh, okay. Okay. That's where I want people to slow down is as they come down over that hump. That's where I'm speeding up. That's where I do hit 20, 25. You're on a bicycle. You're not driving a truck. The old one would be 20. Yeah. yeah. We had you immediately say, "Why don't you fly out?" Downhill. Easy. David, no. 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 Thank you. Can I ask a couple questions? No, no. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, I should have asked you, Mimi. I'm sorry. Well, first question is. Do we offer a collection of for like fluorescent light bulbs, like like long the tube fluorescent, not just the little ones? Is that do we ever have like a hazardous waste? I mean, we probably do, but we take them on a regular basis at the landfill. The uh, long tube ones. Yeah. Is there a fee involved in that? I believe there no. is. I, I have to look at the fee structure, but we do take them at the landfill. Okay. I think they only charge a fee if it's of a high volume. Okay. I think if it's just household. I think one or two. Well, that's I'm talking like like a like a long tube. Yeah, so like what would be in here? Yeah. yeah. And we accept those at the landfill. Huh. Not okay. here. All right. Um, and then I just I know that it would probably be a traffic committee thing, but the lights by Cole Morgan. We have a broken camera light there, a right, broken camera that I believe was repaired yesterday. It could be wrong. Could have continued into today. But there's a broken light there, so it went into a default cycle, oh. which meant it just waited and made the clock and wasn't paying attention as to, well, nobody's waiting here, so we can advance the queue. So it got stuck in a default mode, and it's because of the uh, broken camera. Which is I'm, still on down on, I'm still down on King Street. I was still down on Cole Morgan. Cole Morgan. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, it's... Community it's preservation. Come, so. Come and as long as we're talking about that, how about the uh, cyclist who keeps uh, writing about the light by <laughs> Kay Lanes? Wondering why we can't get the sensor to notice a bicycle. You might, this is, <laughs> when he's poised waiting for the light, it will change. It should recognize a bicyclist. I don't Where know about it. Yeah. Oh, this is the in the, in number yeah. talking Earl Street, I think. Those, that's part of Mass Highway layout, so I need to make a Specific request to Mass DOT. Is it worried his arms? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> he jumped up and down. He said. Is he doing what? Well, he's uh, just sitting there waiting for the light to change. Is it a sensor or is it a camera? Uh, uh, how's it's it, a how sensor. How's I think it sense? I cut it at the pavement. I do go that way sometimes, and I'm turning right, so I don't, I don't bother. I mean, if there's no traffic coming, I just turn right. I mean, first of all, there's also a huge uh, breakdown lane there, so it's not like you're entering traffic on a bicycle. Oh, right. You're really if you're going right. Oh, yeah. maybe he's going straight. And if I'm going well, Mountain but if he's going straight, though, he'd be in with the, the main traffic flow. Yeah. Unless he's just if not he's queuing up on top of the detectors, well, right? Just, yeah. You're all alone. There's no cars. Just go and use a bike path. You're not a car. You might get up and walk, and then, yeah. it's, then it's legal. <laughs> Bicyclists are going to be on bikes. They have to obey the rules of the cars. I know that. I hope we're not cars. Motion for turn. Make a motion. And then you guys can do the sidebar. Thank you, everyone.